I think then we can just start kicking things off. So yeah, thanks everyone for joining, um, as well as our participants online. Um, yeah, and it's it's my pleasure to welcome Uta Diekmann, Dr. Uta Diekmann from the University of Cologne, who's an anthropologist who's been working in Namibia and specifically with uh, the Hakon communities around Itasha National Park for gosh, decades now. Um, the PhD was also focused on aspects of that. Um, and she'll be taking us through some of the historical aspects of the establishment of the park and how that affected the hate bomb communities around it. And then it's also my pleasure to have John Pape here, who is a member of the Global Hate Bomb Association. Um, and is also the association's former vice chairman. And he'll be taking us through more recent developments around land claims, land issues, and the resettlement program. Um, so John is also a resident on one of the resettlement farms on Tufla in the area, um, and will give us some personal recollections and reflections on, on some of the issues that have arisen over the years. But yes, Uta is going to start things off, and then John is going to take over, and I'm going to let John swap seats with me. Um, yeah, Uta, over to you. Thanks, Kelvin. Thanks for the invitation, and thanks for all your interest. And I'm very happy that John Ipe is with us. He, in former times, worked as a translator and field assistant for me in the beginning of the 2000s. Um, in Ocho and the area around Ocho. And I'm very happy. And since then we did never lost touch. So I'm very happy <coughs> Sorry that he takes over to talk more in more detail about the recent developments. Um, what you see here, four people with whom I mainly worked in Etosha on the cultural heritage of the people there during the time when I was involved in a cultural mapping project. And part of what I present here is what I learned from these people. Other parts are archival work, which I did during my PhD, which also was on the high from in and around Etosha and in Ucho. Um, I will first give a short historical outline, the official history of the Etosha National Park before I get into more detail of the history of the Heinkom in and around Etosha. I will there first talk on a time before the 1940s when things started to change, then talk a bit about, explain about Bushman policy and the process of eviction when Heinkom were put out of Etosha, um, and then briefly describe the further developments between the 1950s and independence of Namibia. After that, I, I quickly had one slide on post-independence before um, John takes over to talk about the recent approaches by, or rather recent approach by government to deal with our situation of the Heinkman. Um We all know Natasha. Do you see the picture completely? Or... It's yes. Namibia's untamed wilderness in northern Namibia, and with its 22,000 square kilometer, one of Namibia's most important tourist attractions. It's one of the largest national parks in Africa. Namibia's number one tourist destination. <clears throat> and as you can read <clears throat> on the MEFT website, it's home to 114 large and small mammal species, more than 400 recorded bird species, scores of reptiles, and even a fish species. <clears throat> it was created as game reserve number two in 1907 by the German colonial government. And as a national park, the Etosha National Park, since 1967. It's one of the first three game reserves created by the German administration in, 19, in 1907, as I said. It was at that time the largest conservation area 
in the world, stretching from the Tosha Pan up to the coast, including today's Kaoko, Kaoko Feld or Northern Kunene region. Game Reserve was small and located northeast of Rotfontein, as you can see on a small map, hopefully. And Game Reserve number three was south of the Swarkop River and east of the British enclave of Wallfish Bay, later becoming the Namib Game Reserve and now the Namib Naukluft National Park. Hunting was during that time prohibited in the game reserves without written permission of the district office and vehicle traffic was also prohibited. prohibited. The justification was clearly economic. The benefits that the game reserves will bring to the country will be as follows. Centers will be created from which the game will have to move to the farms where it could be shot and utilized. African game moves very far and so far areas far away from the reserves could also be considered for the supply of game. Clearly, economic reasons were behind the establishment of the game reserves. Game became a valuable resource. Ironically, this had become necessary because European and American explorers, traders and hunters had decreased the wildlife population in the area tremendously during the 19th century. The fact that the last elephants were killed near the Etosha Pan by European hunters in 1881 gives us a rough idea about their activities. Etosha, or the game reserve number two, underwent minor and major border changes and a <clears throat> interesting history, which is not completely part of this presentation, but just to give you an idea. You see the red line was the game reserve number two in 1907. In 1947, south of Etosha was a huge stretch cut off the game reserve and made to commercial farms. And during the same time, Kaoko Feld was declared a native reserve, but stayed part of the game reserve as well. In 1958, things became even more complicated complicated. Here you see the up, all the upper part, the Kaokofeld part, this part is still part of the game reserve, but native reserve, while this part up to the Uha River, the, the green part was added to the game reserve. Um, while a new entity in 1958 came also into being, which is the purple part, which became the Etosha game park during that time. In 1962, again, Etosha Game Park was, so the purple part was, was uh, extended to the coast, but not as far down here, but just to this river. And this area also became the National Park, the Etosha National Park in 1967 with the Nature Conservation Ordinance. Um, so, the reasons for all these changes are very complex and interesting to follow, but not part of this presentation, but it gives you an idea that there must be a lot behind what happened with this game reserve, i.e. game park, i.e. national park. Um, yeah, game preservation was embedded in the colonial agenda and different interests had to be negotiated above all settlement policy and native policy being as important aspects of the colonial endeavor. At the same time, nature conservation, i.e. protected areas, served many purposes and restricted and controlled the mobility of livestock and people. So the national park are the borders of 1970 are the current borders. The fencing of the park was finished in 1973, while the fencing of the southern border, so to the farms, already started in the 1950s. This is now a current map of the area where you can see all the commercial farms south of Etosha, which is a yeah, commercial area. And here you have all the con conservancies now established as well as the concessions in the West, which have been formerly homelands and is now a communal area. So the fencing was, was finished or was completed in the South 
in 1950s, which was necessary, as one farmer explained to me that he had stopped counting the lions he had killed when the number had reached 50. So during that time already, human wildlife conflict was a serious issue. But also Itosha was promoted in the past and is partly still today as untamed wilderness. This area was the, especially the tourist area west of the pan, which you can see on this tourist map, was the home of the Heinkram people. Here you can see more or less the same area we, we during the cultural ma uh, mapping project, which I mentioned, we produced a couple of maps and posters to document and make the cultural heritage of the Heinkram in Etosha visible. Here you can see the main settlements and seasonal mobility patterns explained, as well as knowledge about the animals and the meaning of the different prey animals for Heinkram in the area. And I work with people who are born at different places. One was born at Mahasonep, which is a reed fountain. Another one was born at Sinap, close to Halali. And another one was born at Nubib, close to Namutoni area. I'm sure all of you know these names, at least the tourist names within Etosha. Um, and I work with a couple of others as well. So Etosha was at the heart of the former area inhabited by Heinkram. The Heinkram are one of the San groups in Namibia and in pre-colonial times and early colonial times, they lived in northern central Namibia in and around what later became the Etosha National Park, mostly by hunting and gathering with settlements close to permanent water, but also engaged in trade networks, mining, and they assisted explorers and travelers as tour guides finding water holes or path. Um, this map, which is not very very clear here, but you can see that different people, writers, put the name Hankham or what's resembled it at different areas, but it was clear that the Hankham lived in the whole area of northern central Namibia in pre and early colonial times. From the establishment of the game reserve in 1907 up to the 40s, Hong Kong were accepted as residents in the game reserve. They were allowed to stay at their former settlements and could continue new to hunt and gather. Hong Kong were considered by and large to be part and parcel of the game reserve, also in the context of tourism, as the quote from an article prepared in 1949 indicate. Perhaps one should also mention the Bushmen, although nowadays they are no longer classed as game. They certainly fit into the picture and had to give to the Etosha pen something of the atmosphere of the old wild Africa that is fast disappearing everywhere. So it's clear that there's a certain <laughs> attitude of the col colonial officials behind it, but it's also clear that the people were accepted to to be where they have lived before. Um, so during that time, nature conservation in, or game preservation did not exclude human inhabitants per se, per se. During that time, by and large, hunting and gathering was not seen as a problem, as the following quotes indicate. The amount of game shot by Bushmen is by no means decreasing the game in 26. The game of the pen was, was on increase even after making liberal allowance to the Bushmen there, 36. During the years, some regulations were put in place. For example, from the beginning, no rifles, no dogs came in, I think, in 1930. And the species to be allowed to to be hunted also were restricted or control yeah restricted. Um, High home in the park also had some livestock, goats, cattle, and donkeys at specific waterholes, especially close to Namutoni. 
the presence of the livestock was also was discussed controversially at times, but up to the 40s, it was also tolerated. During the, the rest camps were police stations and some Hankam also worked there. Um, furthermore, Hankam worked in road construction or in mines outside Etosha and between for example, between 38 and 1940, 50 Hankam were employed in road construction. So that was also temporary employment for people who usually stayed at water holes within the Tosha National Park, uh, within the game reserve. Men were also, Hankam men were also temporarily working on farms in the vicinity. Here you can see the southern area of the, of of the commercial area, i.e. border of Etosha. Um, and the red part are farms created in 1947. So beforehand, that part was still part of Etosha and also part of the area inhabited continuously by Hankam. But the, the map is here to show that, yeah, during that time, it was easy to cross the border. There was no fence, but you could move out to work on farms if you were in, in in need for blankets or small money or whatever. And then you used to go back to your home within Etosha to continue living with your family there. Um, yeah, there were no fences, so it was easy to move back and forth. Mm, from the 40s onwards, Hankam also get, got so-called rations at some settlements at the water holes. This was part of a policy to befriend Bushmen, so to, in, in quotation marks. The elderly Hankam with whom I worked could also remember that the tourists came to the water holes, took photos from Hankam and gave them oranges, old clothes or sweets. Tourism became important from the 1930s onwards, but especially after World War II. So in summary, up to the 1940s, Hankam were tolerated in the game reserve and were not considered to be a threat to wildlife. They could hunt and gather for their own consumption. They combined a variety of livelihood strategies with farm work, working on road construction work and the police stations. And Etosha had become the last refuge while the outside area increasingly was settled by farmers, at least the southern area. But things were about to change in the 40s. Two factor was of major importance for this, the potential of nature conservation for tourism with a ex shining example of Kruger National Park, which had also become too full, uh, it was saturated with tourists. So one needed to find new places for tourism. Um, and the model to be followed was that of fortress conservation of, yeah, keeping nature apart from inhabitants or clear, cleaning nature from people. The second point of importance was um, Bush, the Bushman policy in general, general but also the dis discussion on Bushman reserves, which also concerned Heinkram. This was the need of the colonial administration to deal with Bushmen in general, not just with Heinkram, but with all the different so-called Bushman groups, which are now subsumed under the term San, um, was it, the control was difficult due to the high mobility, um, and one idea was the creation of a Bushman res of Bushman reserves, so called, which had popped up against again and again since German colonial times, but was never realized. And the idea of Bushman reserves had uh, a different origin than the idea of native reserves, I think, as well, because native reserves were, were created by the Germ from the German colonial time on to have labor pools for towns and um, farm workers and the industry, mines, etc. Um, 
and to properly control natives. The idea be be behind Bushman reserves also came from from academics, kind of, and anthropologists. I I think that Bushmen, so to say, had to be preserved because they were seen as a survivor of Stone Age, that kind of idea. And this just applied to Bushmen, but not to the native reserves, which were um, established for other local inhabitants in the colony. So the, the idea of a Bushman reserve popped up from, from German colonial times, but was never realized. But um, until the war and after the war, um, the, the, the idea popped up again of a Bushman reserve. And then a commission for the preservation of Bushman was established in 1949 and Schumann who was um, an ethnologist from the ethnology department in South Africa and author of hunting stories, was one of the members. He was also, and that's important, the second full-time game ranger of Etosha. Um, and in the 40s, the tourist potential of Etosha had been recognized and Schumann wanted to develop Etosha along the lines of the Kruger National Park in South Africa. So I do think that his, <coughs> his say in the commission for the developments to come were, was crucial. So in the preliminary report, there was a proposal for a Hankham reserve adjacent to Etosha, but this propo uh, proposal was dropped in the final report, which recommended that all Hankham, except 12 families employed, should leave the game reserve and either look for work on farms or settle in so-called Ovamboland in the north. Um, and the justification for this uh, not establishing a, res a reserve for Heinkham was the following. Nowhere did the administrators, commissioners receive the impression that it would be worthwhile to preserve either the Haikum or the Barakwengwe as Bushmen. In both cases, the process of assimilation has proceeded too far and these Bushmen are already abandoning their nomadic habits and are settling down amongst the neighboring tribes to agriculture and stock breeding. Um, So wait. the need to integrate the Heinkam into the economic system as a labor force at an earlier stage inevitably led to what they call the so assimilation or rather mixing maybe of different cultural elements, elements which was now cited as a reason why it was not necessary to preserve the Heinkam as Bushmen. <laughs> the, sorry, the attitude of the white farmers and especially their need for labor certainly played a role in this decision as they were dependent on high as cheap labor on their farms. So now the recommendation was to evict the high or that, that, that they were not worth to be, to that a uh, game, uh, that a uh, reserve would be established for them or land would be set aside for them. So the, now these recommendations had to be put in practice. And that happened in 1954, according to archival arch, uh, um, documents. One of the people with whom I worked said it was in 1951, and I, I have no clue about that discrepancy. But the native commissioner, be it as it may, the native commissioner of Wamboland had to tell or told the Hankum close to Namutoni, I have come here to tell you that it is the order of the administration that you move out of game reserve number two. The reason for this order is that you are destroying the game. Note that in the archival documents beforehand, 
it was never uh, it was rarely mentioned that there was a real problem be that Hankum hunted for their own consumption with regard to the game populations there. But now it was put in here as a justification for their eviction. You will have to be out of the game reserve, which means their ancestral land. The 1st May 1954, if you are still in the game reserve on that day, you will be arrested and will be put in gold. So in a way, the last refuge was not anymore a last refuge. Etosha, the farms had been there in the in the south beforehand, but Etosha was still a place where people could live and and continue kind of with their traditional way of life or with hunting and gathering. Um, now that was forbidden as well. Um, according to the memories of the Hakan informants, the eviction process started earlier and it was gradual. They used to, to tell me first, let us mark a mark. First, they tamed us before they removed us. And this idea, this terminology of, of tame and wild bushmen, you could often, you can find in archival documents, which at times also counted the Bushman populations in the categories of tame, semi-tame, and wild, um, which is telling enough. And, but there's, yeah, the Hankham said, uh, in their narrative, they were first settled or had to move to easily accessible waterholes near the road or closer to the police stations for years before the final eviction took place. Um, some of the older informants could still remember the native commissioner's speech. They also said that the dogs were killed and their bows and arrows were taken. So, and this photo is from a place close to Namutoni Gome Eyes, where they said that's where the native commissioner gave their spe his speech to the Hankham people. Um, most of the Hankham had to leave the park. Those who had cattle had to take their cattle. Uh, uh, sorry, can I just, can I ask you just to speak into the, I think there's, we're struggling a bit with the acoustics. Oh, <laughs> shit. Yeah. <laughs> Is it better like yeah, this? That's, that's a lot better, yeah. Sorry, you should have told me earlier. No, no, it went it went back and forth. So it was, yeah. Okay. Sorry, okay. Okay. Um so a few Hankum remained in employment at the police stations. But if it happens again, tell me, yeah, early enough. We'll do, yes. So Hankum, henceforth, I had to leave the park, or those who had still be living in the park had to leave the park and was were mainly employed on neighboring farms. At the beginning, they did not realize that it was permanent as they had always been mobile and had worked on farms depending on the season and ecological and economic conditions. It was only with increasing fencing of Etosha and the questions of officials at the gates about the permit to be to enter the park that they realized that it was no longer so easy to send to settle in the park or to to move back to the park john i who will take over oh, over later and myself worked on the histories of farm workers during those times they were characterized by high mobility between farms and violence by farm owners his parents uh, willem Ibe and Elsie's eyes are also part of this farm workers who moved in between several or lots of farms during their lifetime, but st now are still alive and live in Ucho. Um, okay, most of the Hankham worked on farms, but due to the growth of the tourism sector, more workers were needed in Etosha from the end of the 50s onwards, which meant that some were able to return and live and work at the rest camps. They worked in the construction of the tourist accommodation, 
Halali was added as a third rest camp at the end of the 50s, nay, no, end of the 60s, as cleaners, as game rangers in the development of the roads, the construction of the small airstrips, and in the drilling and maintenance of new boreholes. So that was up to the, with independence, lots of Heinkram had in the begin, initially also high hopes in the new government, but the expectations and promises could not be completely fulfilled by the ruling party's WAPO. Many Heinkram were and still are critical about the current government and feel that their interests are not adequately represented in independent Namibia. After, directly after independence or even short time before, due to stricter labor legislation, which also affected farm work, many farmers dismissed workers. As a result, many Heinkram moved to the townships of Ucho, Otavi, Hotfontein, or Oshiveli, Oshivelo, and had hardly any income. Often, entire families were and are dependent on the pension money to which over 60-year-olds in Namibia are entitled. Due to still ongoing discrimination against San and low levels of education mostly, most younger Hankam also have little prospect to improve their situation easily. And now I think I hand over to um, John to talk about the recent approaches by the Namibian government, which during the time of the centenary in 2007 started to buy resettlement farms for the Hankam. Thanks for your attention and sorry for the acoustics. Uh, no worries. We just thanks so much. Let's hand over. To John, John, you have the floor. You can, yeah, you can just ask Uta to change slides. Yeah. Uta, can you change the lines? To where? Uh, since uh, 2008, when the first seven farms were bought. But that was on just now. It was okay that now, since 2008, the, the government has purchased seven farms close, close the southern border of Etosha, specifically for the, I mean, the one farm east of Etosha. These farms were bought after the uprising, which we had in at the, at the Etosha Gate. The first uprising was at the Etosha Gate, and the cabinet uh, decided to buy farms for the Haitian, uh, close to the Etosha border. But the problem now there was uh, people in Etosha uh, felt they do not want to leave their homeland and they would not move to the farms. And uh, some people wanted these farms to stay at these farms. And uh, and the Etosha people were also excluded from the tourism activity which was supposed to be done there. So they felt uh, their homeland is Etosha and they have one a piece of, because government does not utilize all the land that they wanted, a piece of land there. But some people wanted to move to these farms. And the government uh, plan was actually at farm charges to build a lot there where we as a community could uh, also benefit from the natural resources in our area. And this idea could not be, could not materialize because there was no fighting. Some people want to stay in the torture, some people want to move to the farms. That's how the government also struggled to, to come in to assist the community uh, with the lodge and the concession which was supposed to be given there. Okay, Uda. And after the, uh, in 2012, the Community Association was established to oversee the wildlife tourism concession around the Kobok area in the Etosha National Park. 
So as I've said, the Kobab Association Committee is having a, a constitution, but unfortunately, uh, the constitution was maybe presented to or educated to us in 45 minutes time. And the chief also wanted uh, to help pick the, the committee members, he did not want, because we were very new in this type of concession and the com uh, community activities and the chief felt he would like to help pick the community, uh, committee members. We held the election and then committee members were elected, but unfortunately the chief did not want to support uh, this project because there were too much politics involved. Chief wanted his, his own people to be happy, but the, the government said which, uh, it, people must be elected. The constitution of the association was drawn up by lawyers in Windhoek without proper consultation or participation of the potential members and without taking the realities on the ground into account benefits from the concession should only be available to the residents on the settlement parts. So that was on, also part of a problem. Hayton people are, there's a lot of Hayton people, but according to the constitution, only community members resettled at the farms were supposed to benefit from this uh, tourism project. They had concession contract for the Etosha South activity concession between the government of the Republic of India through MET and the Haikon community presented by the chairperson of the Haikon uh, Association was signed on 27th of September 2012. So after the signing of, of the head concession contract, the chief was uh, uh, used to write letters to government saying he does not support the concession. And again, people in Etosha felt they are excluded. And so while the uh, government could not implement uh, this idea because of the fightings amongst the community. And the other thing which I would like also to, to bring under your attention is now, these farms which were bought by government, some of us were very lucky to, to be at the farmers' farms where they allowed the Roman Catholic Church to come and pick us up to go to uh, uh, Roman Catholic schools. But some farmers did not allow uh, uh, the church to, to pick up some of the children to, to the Roman Catholic churches. So that's why most of them, most of us are are not educated. What else did I let out? Um, yeah, that was, and then, and the other thing is also now, when, uh, when the consulate was, was given, the chief wanted to hand pick uh, the, uh, the, the bidders. He did not want the, the concession to be advertised. And so now, because the chief wanted, and it was also the, the process also prolonged. But after that, we, after that, after the government also in, in, uh, came in, the concession was advertised. After the ad advertisement, it was now Ngawa Game Reserve and the Wilderness, who was the two main leaders. And Ngawa won the, the the concession. And now, after that, uh, the documents were three big documents, and we wanted a lawyer to assist us with the, with the explanation of the, of the contract we have signed. Uh, we, we didn't first sign, but we, 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 we were told on Gava won the contract. But before we signed the contract, we wanted a lawyer to assist us to explain to us this contract. But then we, as the community, we just told uh, was going to move us and the contract must be signed. signed. And when we came there, the representatives from Ongawa were there. And the community, some of we, we wanted before 
Simon would want it to be explained in detail. The community were there, the community said, we are hungry, the contract must be signed. So we, after we signed the contract, nothing happened for two years. And while we were waiting, uh, after we signed the contract, the, even Ungava did not come back to us. And then we, we the first committee was now. They, they called us and they said, ah, your term has lapsed and you are no more in the management committee. And then we, new committee has been established now. There is a new committee. There is also a border fence which has been uh, erected there. At least the, the fencing, the fencing, Haitian people from the farms were, were employed there temporarily. And, and then the other thing is now the farm which was supposed to be in or supposed for the for the for the lodge to be built was Chavez. But uh, what the government said is now uh, that time they did not have money uh, to buy that farm because now we are hearing now that uh, the the farms our farms are not suitable to build a lodge. So we will wait and see now what will happen. Is it going to be built at a private private farm, or what is going to happen? I think John, maybe it's helpful just to elaborate on the resettlement program in general, and what the situation is on the resettlement yeah. farm. Yeah, and the resettlement farms. Another thing at the resettlement farms is now the farms. It's farm Serengops alone. It's, it's 300 people are resettled. Belalaiga, 200. Tuflech, 200. Berta, 200. And the situation at that farm is very difficult. Even water, the situation of water. Government, when they come, they say we must make backyard gardens. But even water to drink is not, it's not enough there. What they say is they come people are lazy. But the situation there is very worst. And the, uh, and, the, and the other thing is now, people, other people are also coming in. People with money are also coming in, and those people are now getting the best places where they can live with their cattle. They come are now trapped in the corner. There. So, can I? Yeah, and I think. Uta, Uta, you you wanted to um, also add something about the land claim, right? Yeah, yeah, briefly, but for the resettlement farms, what I I just want to summarize in the beginning the idea for the Heinkom with conservancy like institutions on these resettlement farms, the idea was kind of promising. But what happened is that government bought these farms, but due to the land reform process, they were not able to buy all the farms in the beginning because it was building a willing, willing buyer, willing seller um, principle. So they bought, bought them piece by piece. And the, the, the land use plan, for example, was developed four years before people started to be resettled. So in my view, people were just kind of, to put it bluntly, to, bluntly they were dumped on these resettlement farms without any option for proper livelihood strategies. It wasn't much better than in the informal settlements in town. It was a bit maybe quieter and people really, lots of people, I think, preferred staying on the resettlement farms because it's not as packed. But livelihood options are very low. Um, you can't do a lot. People leave, live in sink, sink houses there. And I mean, one can also remember a normal farm. It's like 5,000 hectare. Usually, in former times, one commercial farmer lived on this farm. And often, these farmers were not in particular rich. And they had farm workers, of course, whom they didn't pay well. 
but this is not a really agricultural productive area. How are 300 people to be able to survive on these resettlement farms when sometimes a single farmer with his family and his workers struggle to survive on these farms? So there is no proper planning on, for these kind of resettlement projects. And um, they kind of, there's a the risk that they develop into rural slums. They're a bit better than town slums, I think, or people prefer them, maybe. But it's also the transport to health facilities and to get the pension money is much more difficult. I think John also mentioned that people have the transport. Yeah, it's difficult to get someone with a car to, to drive to Ocho. Or to, I know old people who had a donkey car and they could go with a donkey car to Ocho, but I mean, those are people with more than 60, 70 years old, which need to go to Ocho to get their pension money. So the situation on these resettlement farms, I think, is not very um, promising or well thought through. That's what I wanted to, and the idea. In, in the beginning was better, but nothing up to now, it didn't really realize. And it much was also done without proper consultation and real involvement of the community. As John mentioned, the traditional authority issue is an issue which makes it difficult with whom to talk to within the community. But yeah, the situation is not the best. Could you hear me? Yes, can I also add, add the education the government in the beginning? After the chief recognition just to allow students from the Hakim community to go and study for nursing and education, education. But most of these opportunities were went to the chief's family because the opportunities was first come to the chief's uh, office, and then his children and his children's friends, and the situation of educational level, it is also much changed there. And employment also, sometimes government used to uh, ask for chief for five people to be appointed in government positions, but usually, uh, it went to his children, his children's friends. And we have tried several times with anti-corruption. There was also a two million from a company which is having fishing quotas, two million and then eight hundred thousand dollars. And then the chief bought all his in-laws and his councillors got their cars because bought the cars for the people at the farm to go to the hospital, sell them to be taken to schools. But those cars are only sold by his councillors. They never benefited the community. I think that this is also a good um how do you say überleitung to go to the to the to the land claim. To explain, the, the High Come Traditional Authority was not a traditional authority <laughs> elected by the people, but kind of because of his uh, Swapo connections, he was made High Come Traditional Authority. That's why there are lots of internal conflicts with regard to this traditional authority or chief, which, which John mentioned. And this he mentioned in different regards, and this was also the reason, or this is a point which is an obstacle with regard to how could Hong Kong go about their situation, so to say. And another group of Hong Kong, or a huge group of Hong Kong, but um, wait, where am I? I'm, Another group of Hong Kong who have not who are not part of the chief's faction, they decided to to get the assistance of the legal assistance center to get advice 
because they feared they were they were thrown out of Etosha and they would lose their access to their ancestral land. So they discussed with the legal assistance center, but the problem was in which name do you do that kind of land claim? Do you do it in the name of all Heinkham or do you do it in the name of particular individuals who were still allowed to live or had been allowed to live in Etosha or could show close connections to Etosha? And since we all people were of the opinion that all Heinkham had lost their land, but Etosha was a area which you could still claim because it was state land and not commercial farm. It was discussed what, what is the best way to go about it. And since the traditional authority was not really in favor of the land claim because it was against government and government paid in a way paid him, um, he didn't want to be part of it. And then it was decided that first a class action application needed to be launched. And class action lawsuits are at this stage not an option in Namibian law, and the country's law would need to be developed to allow the applicants to pursue the legal action in the representative capacity on behalf of their community. And then eighth Heinkam were the applicants in these actions from different communities out of Etosha, from Otavi, from Rotfontein, from Zumeb, from Inetosha, with the main applicant being Jan Sumeb from who is now living on farm Undera. Um, so they tried to get this class action through so that a claim, a land claim could be made on behalf of the Heinkham. This case was heard in November 2018, but it was dismissed in 2019 because of the traditional authorities issue. In short, uh, I'm not a lawyer, but it was said that the traditional authority of a community needs to deal with the land issues. And if so, then it needs to be made in his name, the application or the land claim. So that's why the case was dismissed in 2019. The appellants appealed the judgment in the Supreme Court. Um, they had revised their strategy, etc., and the Supreme Supreme Court again dismissed the Heinkham lit uh, the Heinkham case, but for different reasons to the Heinkham court. <clears throat> so the Supreme Court opined that the Traditional Authorities Act did not grant the Heinkham Traditional Authority with exclusive powers to pursue the community's claims, <laughs> and it pointed to the possibility to form kind of a voluntary organization called Universitas to, to put up such a legal land claim. That was now in, I think, 2000, I don't know when the Supreme Court dismissed the case, but just recently, I think. And so the actual land claim of the Heinkham was not yet brought to court, only the issue of local standing. And the LAC had now meetings again in October to talk about the case and if they want would like to, to go further with this case, because now with this kind of universitas, with that voluntary organization, there's another option to go to court without changing, challenging the Traditional Authorities Act first. But we don't know what other, I mean, legal actions are very expensive, both with costs and with um, human powers or capacities. So I'm not sure if this goes any further. We will see. <laughs>